Okay, so we left off with um, this problem where we were uh, looking at 100 gram sample each of sodium hydroxide, potassium chloride. You remember that? We were going to calculate the concentration in molarity for each one. And the point of this whole operation was um, molarity is based upon moles per liter. So 100 grams of sodium hydroxide is a different number of moles than 100 grams of potassium chloride. So you're going to end up with uh, different values for your concentrations. Right? And I made the correction here, so it, the math is right now. <laughs> okay, now we can get into... Uh, 8.7 that I slid into a little bit last time, but we'll, we'll back up and take another run at it. <clears throat> so, um, in the real world, uh, in the laboratory setting, if you have a lot of samples to analyze and you need um, a large volume of a certain concentration of a reagent, uh, it's impractical to have to make up that large volume day in and day out each day because uh, more often than not, you have solids that are going into solution and it takes some time to, to get everything set up that way, large volumes like that. So what we would do typically is make up concentrated solutions with the same ratio of solutes because they usually had more than one solute in the solution. And the ratio between the uh, solutes would be the, exactly the same, but they would be more concentrated on a relative scale than the working solution that was your target. And in this scenario, we're talking about um, dilute concentration versus, what is that S? I would have a C here for concentrated. <clears throat> oh, stock solution. I get it. Well, that's, that's fair. Stock solution is more concentrated. So you want to uh, dilute the stock solution to make your working solution at the beginning of the day or whenever you're, you're due to analyze your 100 or 200 samples. <clears throat> and the, um, the theory behind this is you have a prepared solution of a concentration here and you want to end up with your working solution let's just say it's one liter total there um, so you want to take a portion out of this and add more solvent if you add more solvent that dilutes all the solutes and if the solutes are established at a concentration over here a ratio then they'll be the same ratio over here. They'll all be diluted by the same amount. So let's focus on just one solute. That one solute, you'd say, is um, a concentration of, say, 10 molar. Okay? And you want to end up over here with 0.1 molar of the solute. So you want to take a portion of it out of here, put it in there, and then add more solvent. Uh, let's just say it's water. Okay. So what do these things have in common? Well, the concentrations are different, obviously. Right. Concentrations are different, but the, the common thread here is the number of moles of solute that you bring over. So if you have a certain volume of this stock solution times the molarity, or the concentration here, then that equals uh, a, um, a certain number of liters of sample. Uh, no, it, moles, I'm sorry. Uh, this is liters. This would be moles. Moles of solute. Okay, that's what you're bringing over. So the common thread is the moles you bring over that you pull out of here, the same number of moles you put over here. Exactly equal. So if you want to know the number of moles over here, you get that 
If you want to know the number of moles over here, <clears throat> um, you get concentration times uh, volume is also equal to the number of moles of solute. Okay, so that's why this expression works because that's equal to moles of solute and that's equal to moles of solute. So A equals B and B equals C, A equals C. <clears throat> Sometimes you see it expressed as uh, M1V1 equals M2V2 or uh, MCBC equals MDBD, concentrated dilute. And since these are all ratioed, I mean, if you solve this for a volume, I right, put volume on one side and molarity on the other side, which would be, okay, then it doesn't matter what the units are, right? You can use milliliters. Or liters, doesn't matter, they cancel. Okay, so that's nice. You don't have to convert to liters every time you do it. All right. <clears throat> So that's the whole basis for uh, dilution of concentrated solutions or stock solutions into working solutions. So let's say we have um, 100 milliliters of 0.9% saline solution in water. And oh, we wanna prepare 100 milliliters of 0.9% uh, saline from a 10% saline. Now, before we used molarity, but concentration, it doesn't matter what the units are. Okay, so you can use, that's why they, it's probably why they used uh, C instead of M for molar. So what you want to do is set up your set, set up a list. So the uh, stock concentration, the volume of the stock, the uh, working solution, and the volume of the working solution. Those are the things you need to know. This is the concentrated side, this is the diluted side. So we're aiming for 100 milliliters, final volume, and we want the concentration to be 0.9%. We're gonna make it from a 10% solution. So this is our unknown. So you would just say um, 10 times Vs equals 0 0.9 times 100, okay? So this would be, say 10, and that'd be 10, 10 would be nine. The volume of this needs to be nine milliliters. Diluted to 100 milliliters would give you the desired concentration, okay? Oh, so that means, oh, I got it animated here, except for that glitch. I think that should be uh, an X. Okay. All right. What about this one? 0 0.5 molar solution of sodium chloride sits on a lab bench, which of the following would decrease the concentration of the salt solution? Add water. Oh, yeah, because that's your solvent. Right? So we got that one working for us. Pour some of the solution down the sink. <laughs> so, you're pouring both solute and solvent at the same time. That's not going to have any effect. Add more sodium chloride. It's going the wrong direction because that's the solute that you're adding. Let the solution sit out on the open air for a couple of days. That would evaporate the solvent and make the solute more concentrated, okay? And E is no good because we already found one. And the rest of them are false. Okay. So that was your answer. 
What's the minimum volume of two molar sodium hydroxide solution needed to make 150 milliliters of pointed molar sodium hydroxide solution? All right. In this case, we can use the M1, B1, M2, B2. So if this is the concentrated side, we need to have two molar. And then this is our unknown. How much of that do we need to bring over? to give us a 0 0.8 molar solution and 150 milliliters of it. So we solve for, solve for B1. That one times that one divided by this one. See, do I have it animated? Just got the answer. 60 milliliters. So that means we need 60 milliliters of the concentrated diluted to that volume gives us this concentration. Okay, we've talked about um, solutions, homogeneous mixtures up to this point. Um, the, this is a special kind, this particular one right here. Let me see if I can use that. Yeah, this particular one, colloidal dispersion is not a solution. It appears homogeneous as a mixture. So there's sort of a, a gray area between solutions and colloidal mixtures, colloidal dispersions. The primary difference is um, that scenario we discussed where you make a solution and the uh, solute, you have to break the bonds of the solute and you have to break the bonds of the solvent, make a hole, and then you bring them back together and they form uh, a bond, intermolecular bond. In a colloid, in a dispersion like this, you don't have those bonds. What you have is particle size, the size of the particle. It could be down to the mo molecule. But if the particle is small enough, then the kinetic energy of the dispersing medium is sufficient to keep the, the uh, dispersed substance from settling. Okay, so that's a, that's a fundamental difference between solutions and colloidal dispersions is the mechanism that keeps them from settling. Solutions form those intermolecular bonds with the solvent, solute solvent but colloidal dispersions don't. The only thing that keeps them suspended is small size for the dispersed medium and energy, kinetic energy from the dispersing medium that bangs into them and keeps them from settling. Okay. So this homogeneous mixture, in this case, it's not a solution. Um, so that's why we pick, we use a different terminology. The dispersed phase is similar to the solute and the dispersing phase medium is similar to the solvent. They have analogous functions. They just do it differently. Um, examples, let's see, what would be a colloid? There are lots of, lots of examples, some that you wouldn't even suspect. But a common one is um, jello. Jello is not a solution. You know, it's kind of a Part of it's a solution, part of it's, part of it's a colloid. The protein, the, the uh, gelatin protein that's derived from animal bones and hooves of slaughtered animals, they just boil it out. And that's, that makes your jello. So now you're never going to eat jello again. <laughs> but then the, the flavorings and the sugar, those actually do go into solution. So you have a combination there. If it's just pure gelatin, that's a colloid and nothing else. But if you buy uh, Jello, say you just had your tonsils out and that's all you can eat, then uh, it'll have sugar and flavoring and the colloid also. Okay, so um, the, a practical way of determining whether you have a solution or a colloid is this phenomenon, the Tyndall effect. 
Have I described this to you before? Okay. Yeah, you just need a, a bright light. Uh, here's your suspect. And all you need is a bright light to shine in there. And then you look at it from this side. And you look at it from, from this side. Right? And from this side, you're going to see light, unless it's completely opaque. You're going to see light coming through for both of them. But if you look around on the side, what do you see going through? If it's a solution, you don't see the beam of light here at all. Um, the most you would see is the light that is uh, refracted from the glass. Right? But that's not the same thing. You see, if it's a colloid, you see a beam. Because those particles are not solutes. They're dispersed medium. And they're there because they're very small size, but they can still um, reflect light off each individual particle. So that's how you tell. And my other class is going to use that today. We're going to do a titration and use the Tyndall effect to more accurately find the end point because we've got a, it's a precipitation reaction making sulfur chloride. And the particles are so small, by the time you can see them with the naked eye, you've gone way past the end point. So we're going to use the Tyndall effect, and just shine a light through there. And as soon as you, you see the, the precipitate and that beam of light, you got your end point. Okay. Oh, there's your example. Um, this should be a true solution. Well, they're saying this is a colloid. Well, I can't verify that. This is a solution because you don't see the beam of light in here. But this one's too thick. Maybe it's just a bad picture. Let me see. Is there one on the next? No, there's none on the next page. So I think the idea is this one's a colloid and that's a solution. You should be able to see the beam of light coming through, but it's such a bad reproduction. We probably ought to move on. Okay. Suspensions. Uh, suspensions are are kind of like colloids, except the particles are too big. They will not remain suspended forever. You can agitate them really fast and get them mixed up really well. But if you let them set, then those uh, suspended particles will settle out. And all, all precipitation reactions will do that eventually. When you put two solutions together and the reaction produces precipitate, then they call it precipitate for a reason. Over time, it precipitates out. That's a suspension. And it is heterogeneous. Even when, you, when it looks like it's uniformly mixed, it's not. Okay. So this is a, a one-stop shop comparison of solutions, colloids, and suspensions. And we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it because we've, we beat this horse to death already. Uh, we might point out that the types of particles that you find in solutions can be atoms, ions, or very small molecules, like um, sugar molecules. Um, colloids will have small particles, or they could have large molecules, but the, by comparison, the Molecules are small enough that they can be the energy of the suspending medium can give them enough, enough energy that they don't settle. And then suspensions have the particle size is the difference. The particle size here is an increase for suspensions. Sometimes you can even see the particles. So we use uh, water and sand. You mix water and sand together, and you can tell right off, even if you're mixing furiously, that it's heterogeneous. 
Um, we already talked about the effect of light. These solutions are transparent. Dispersions are uh, scatter light. And suspensions are really variable. It just depends on how much of these suspended particles you have in there. If you have just a few of them, then the light will pass through. Uh, let's see. Oh, how would you separate? If you, if you had a mixture, right? Each component of the mixture is still unique chemically. So you should be able to separate them physically. Use some physical property that's, uh, that describes how they behave and use that property to separate. So let's work backwards. For a suspension, right, all you have to do is separate them on, based on particle size. So you can either let them settle or you can run them through a filter for the particle size. That you, you can get different grades of filters. Uh, you can have ones with large holes in them. You get medium holes, small holes. You can get, I mean, molecule size holes. Those guys under gravity would take forever to filter. So those types of filters usually put in a special device called a vacuum filtration unit. And you pull a vacuum in the collecting unit underneath, and it drives them faster through those tiny pores. But filtration will separate uh, components of a suspension. Uh, colloids, you can't filter them out. The particles are just too small. So what you have to do is determine what is the nature of the suspended medium and the suspension, the suspending medium. And you may have to use an alternate method of separating. Uh, for instance, um, if the suspended medium is non-volatile and the suspending medium is volatile, you would boil it off. Well, if it's the other way around, then uh, uh, you can separate them by distillation. And just boil them off, catch it in a, in a cooling, a cool area, and it drips out in your container. Solutions are that way also. They cannot be filtered. So uh, a physical separation would be based upon the difference in vapor pressure. So heat it up. And um, the one that has the highest vapor pressure will come off first. And you catch it, and then the next one comes off as you heat it up higher and higher. The next one comes off, catch it. That's fractional distillation. Okay. All right, we need, don't need to beat this horse too much. Uh, colloidal dispersion contains small particles. It's a mixture but they're not visible to the naked eye. Um, they don't settle under the influence of gravity. Now, um, I will add this. If you have the equipment, if you have a, a, a centrifuge, then you can magnify the, the effect, the forces that normally would, you can go past one G, you go way up like a thousand Gs. And if you get high enough, then you can separate um, colloids with a centrifuge. And it just depends on, we used to have actually one, two, three, four, four different types of centrifuges in the lab I worked in. One is like the bulk. We used it for spinning soil solutions. Uh, so it was a big old metal thing. It was really robust but it didn't have to spin very fast. And then we had the little tabletop ones like they use for hematocrits. You stick the little tubes in there and settle the blood out. And you pull it out and say, ratio needs to be what? For a hematocrit, it's uh, solids or 55. Uh, depends on what you want to do. Or 45, one or the other. It's normal. I, all I know is a tube like that. Mm -hmm. So coag, I'll be 50, 50. That's that 50% serum, 50% red blood cell. Okay. Um, so you got those little ones that sit on your countertop 
And we actually had one of those that was, uh, could be evacuated and refrigerated. So if you have a, particularly, um, you have components that are susceptible to heat degradation, then spinning them is going to add energy and it's going to heat them up. So we would cool it down. And then we had a, a, a big refrigerated centrifuge set like this with a head on it like that. And you could change the heads with different tube sizes in it. And then we had another one sitting over in the corner that was an ultra centrifuge. It spun so fast that we had to seal the, the, the case and evacuate it because there's too much resistance from the air if you leave air in there. So we evacuate it and you could spin it up to 10,000 RPM, 20,000 RPM, really, really fast. <clears throat> Let's see, let me go back to this. Um, okay, so it's a mixture that contains particles that cannot be filtered through large pore filter paper. That's true. Okay, let's talk about colligative properties because we're going to use one of those colligative properties today. Um, a colligative property is first and foremost a physical property <clears throat> of a solution. So you don't have a pure substance, you have a mixture. And the colligative property of this mixture, this solution, is based purely upon uh, the number of solute particles in solution. And it doesn't matter what they are. It is irrelevant. So that's a good thing. Um, so if you have a solution of um, uh, 1% sodium chloride, let's say 1% ions, right, because sodium chloride will break apart. So it'd be like a half percent sodium chloride would give you 1% ions. Okay? And if you also had a 1%, well, let's see, this needs to be a molar, excuse me. Say one molar ions, and then one molar sucrose in this solution. They would both physically behave the same way for any of these colligative properties. It doesn't matter what the solute. And that's a good thing because then if you don't know what the molecule is and um, remember when we were doing uh, empirical formulas and molecular formulas, <laughs> blank stairs, <laughs> we give, you know, you were given percent composition by mass of say carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and we calculated the empirical formula. But in order to go from empirical to molecular formula, we needed an independently determined molar mass for the compound. Well, if you don't know what the compound is, I mean, you're given percent composition, you don't know what it is. You can calculate an empirical formula, but you don't know what the molecular formula is. So any of these properties might be useful for determining the molar mass of that unknown compound, because it doesn't matter what the compound is. You can tell how many moles of the compound you have um, from a given mass of the compound. And then if you, if you know moles and mass, you can calculate molar mass. And then you can use that in your calculations to go from empirical to molecular formula. Okay. So these are, these are very useful for, for doing that type of analysis. Okay, so we have um, it's important to note that the number of solute particles is the key. And that they could be whole molecules, they could be ions. So if you have a, um, a compound that dissociates when it goes into solution, then you would need to know how many ions are produced from that solution, or from that compound. So that's, that's a catch right there. Okay, 
So we're going to look at uh, these four. The vapor pressure will change for a solution compared to the, um, the pure solvent. Pure solvent has a vapor pressure. If you add some solute to it, it will decrease the vapor pressure. Okay. That can be quantified. Uh, we can elevate the boiling point. So if you, if you have uh, water that boils at 100 degrees C and you add a big uh, handful of salt to it, then the boiling point will go up, It'll boil at a higher temperature. Or that same solution would freeze at a lower temperature. We're gonna use this one today um, to help us determine the molar mass of benzoic acid. And then the last one is osmotic pressure. So we need, we have to define what osmotic pressure is if you don't already know what it is. But if, if you've been introduced to uh, certain aspects of physiology, but I'm certain that they talked about osmotic pressure, right? No? General biology class, not even that. Okay, well, anatomy, they should have given you a little bit about osmotic pressure. Right? Iso, isotonic solutions, hypertonic solutions, hypotonic solutions. They didn't talk about that? Yeah, we're probably, we're probably, we're probably past that. Okay, okay. Well, we're, you can uh, quantify the uh, tonicity of your solution. Uh, I'm sure in anatomy and physiology, they were just in general terms. Right? If the solution has a higher concentration of solute in it than the cell, then the solution is hypertonic. And if it has a lower concentration of solute, then the cell is hypotonic. If it is exactly the same, they're isotonic. But we can, we can quantify the difference in uh, uh, pressure forcing water through that membrane either direction, we can quantify it with a given relationship. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But if I'll get off the topic and move to the next slide. Okay, vapor pressure. Vapor pressure uh, calculations are based upon Rayleigh's law. That's this guy right here. <clears throat> and if you know the vapor pressure of the pure solvent, and that's what this little zero means. That solvent is pure. Um, then what you need is this modifier to that value. This is a fraction. It's less than one, always less than one. It's a fraction, 0 0.5, 0 0.1, 0 point whatever. <clears throat> but it's a, it's a special kind of fraction. It's a mole fraction. So I have to define what a mole fraction is. Sometimes I, I use the plain old X here, but if you have the typographic ability, it should look fancier than that. So that's a mole fraction. And the mole fraction is simply um, moles of solute per total moles. Right? So that would be, um, this could be any combination. You could have 10 different solutes in here, but you have to add them all up with the moles of solvent, total moles. Mole fraction would be just what fraction of the total is that solute, okay? So that's why it's always less than one, right? If the mole fraction is one, what does that mean? That means there, there are no solutes in it. It's pure solvent. <clears throat> okay. So once we know that mole fraction, then and the value for um, vapor pressure, then we can multiply that and find out what the vapor pressure of the solution is. Now this would be just for one. Uh, You know what? Come to think of it, 
This is a colligative property. This mole fraction could be the mole fraction of all the solutes. Right? If it's just one, of course, it's just that one solute. But if you have more than one, it doesn't matter what they are, as long as you know how many moles of solute there are, A, B, C, D, add them all together, that mole fraction then, they go together, they combine to this mole fraction. So we could put an S there actually, if we have more than one. And this would give us the vapor pressure of the solution. So since that's less than one, this is always gonna be less than that. So we're depressing the vapor pressure by adding solute to it. Okay, so here's the, um, here's an artist's depiction of what's actually happening. Why is the vapor pressure decreasing? Remember, vapor pressure is an, is an established equilibrium between a, uh, a liquid and the space, the head space above it in a closed vessel. You have to, it has to be closed. Otherwise, you never establish an equilibrium. Once it's closed, and that, they should have done this. They should have put caps on those things. Once it's enclosed, then uh, this is the pure solvent. These molecules of solvent initially leave the surface, and there are none up here. But eventually, you get enough up here, they start returning. So you get this way and that way, both. And once, and once the rate of leaving the surface is equal to returning, evaporation is equal to condensation, then you have equilibrium. And it establishes a given pressure here. Okay? Now, if you put a, uh, a non-volatile solute in here, these yellows, right, they're not going to leave the surface. Like sodium chloride is non-volatile, or sugar is non-volatile. Then the only thing that leaves the surface to make that vapor pressure is the solvent. But there are two things going on here. One is purely physical interference. At the surface, you have these non-volatile molecules taking up space. Right? So you can only leave from here and here where there, there's not the yellow. Right? So that reduces the number that can leave into the vapor phase, decreasing the pressure. The other thing is, um, you can have attractions between the yellows and the grays, between the solutes and the solids. If there's attraction there, that will also decrease the uh, vapor pressure. But there's another deviation here. If there's a repulsion between these two, then you can actually skew the vapor pressure up from what you would expect if there were no interaction. Maybe we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so that uh, Reynolds law, let's see, let's put it up here just, just so we can keep it. Solution equals mole fraction times pure solvent. That's Reynolds. The next one is boiling point elevation. If you add a solute to a solvent, it will change the boiling point. It will actually increase the boiling point by a certain amount. We call delta T. This is the change in temperature. And it's always absolute value. We don't care about the sign because we know boiling point elevation is going to increase the boiling point. So it's just uh, a positive number, okay? So that means if you measure the boiling point of your solvent, and then you put a certain number of molars in there, then it will change, it will have a change in temperature, okay? So how is that related mathematically? Well, first of all, 
we have to change the unit of concentration. We're dealing with temperature change here. And we know that if we use molarity, moles per unit volume, what happens when the temperature changes? That changes. So your concentration is not, is not uh, reliable if you use volume. So we can't use molarity for these uh, temperature change equations. So what we use instead is called molality. It's similar to molarity, except molality now is moles per kilogram of solvent. Okay, instead of liters of solution, now we're kilograms of solvent. And now temperature has no effect on that value. So there are two changes actually. We're using mass and we're using only the solvent. And we don't include the mass of the uh, solvent. Whereas with molarity, we have the volume of the solution that includes everybody. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, that one is a change. And this one here, this constant, is particular to the solvent. Uh, and it just has to be determined empirically. So if you're going to use this equation, this is based upon solvent. This K is the... Um, Boiling point elevation constant. And you just have to be given that unless the experiment calls for determining this and that and calculating that, but we're not doing that. Today. You're given this value. And you're, the experiment you're doing determines this. Actually, not for boiling point, it's for freezing point, but we'll get to that in a second. But they're similar. They're, they're arranged mathematically. They're similar. <clears throat> so this is particular to the solvent. And it, it, it varies. <clears throat> so once you know, once you can determine, uh, and for water, here it is, it's degrees Celsius per molality. So notice that if you have this times this of the uh, solution, then these two cancel and degree C on this side and degree C on this side. So if we do some unit analysis, we see that it's kosher. Okay, um, another caveat. These values are always determined at standard temperature and pressure, 25 degrees C, one atmosphere. So you're in the neighborhood of 25 degrees and one atmosphere pressure, then uh, this value will hold. And you can go pretty far. You can go pretty far afield from that, and it's still useful. Standard concentration is one molar. Um, that doesn't apply here because we're not using molarity, we're using molality. But in those cases where you need standard concentration, then it's one molar. But not for these uh, boiling point elevation and freezing point depression. It wouldn't work. Okay, um, let's see. All right, so we had this Boiling point elevation, change in temperature is K with our constant here times molality of the solute. Okay. Freezing point depression is similar to that. It's a change in temperature, only now the temperature is depressed. But we still, it's still an absolute value. 
we drop the negative side. It's just a change in temperature. If the freezing point is depressed by two degrees Celsius, we don't say negative two, we just say two. And then we have another K, which is different even for water. Uh, well, here's a good example. It was 0 0.5 before. For freezing point depression, it's 1.86. Right? So they're, they're different constants depending on which one you're using. Oh, excuse me. Freezing point. And then this is also the molality of the solid. And we use this phenomenon um, every summer. If you make your own ice cream, right? you get pour your ice in there in the in the ice machine maker, uh, ice cream maker, and then you dump a bunch of rock salt on it. And as it as the ice starts to melt and it dissolves the salt you get a very concentrated brine, very high concentration. This goes way up times that means the depression of the temperature is large. Right? So you can freeze things like custard. You could freeze water at you know, zero degrees Celsius. But if you're gonna have custard, it's behaving the same way. Right, its freezing point is depressed because you've got a lot of solute in there, like whatever's in the custard, okay. lots of sugar, of course. <clears throat> but that depresses its freezing point, so you've got to depress the freezing point of the environment around it as you churn it, otherwise it'll never freeze. So you actually have two freezing point depressions going on at the same time, one inside the custard and one outside in the brine. <clears throat> But we can use, we can measure this is what we're gonna to do today. We're gonna to, we're gonna measure the freezing point for um, lauric acid, it's a fatty acid, and then the pure freezing point, the, the pure, yeah, freezing point for the pure lauric acid. And then we're gonna add a known amount, a measured amount of benzoic acid. Right? And we're gonna see what effect it has on the temperature. Right. So we'll have this value, we'll have this given for lauric acid, because that's the solvent, and then that will tell us the molality of the solution. So if you have the molality of the solution, which is moles per kilogram of solvent, we know how much solvent we put in there. Right. So we got that value. And that's equal to some value, right? So you know this one, that one, that one. You can find out how many moles of benzoic acid you put in that mixture. And you also know its mass. You know moles, you know mass. Calculate the molar mass of benzoic acid. Okay. So that's one, two, three. Rayleigh's law, boiling point elevation, freezing point depression. And, oh, uh, how does the addition of a non-volatile solute to the solvent affect the vapor pressure? The vapor pressure decreases when you add a sol uh, solute to it. Okay. Um, osmosis and osmotic pressure. So um, this is where it gets, sometimes it gets a little confusing. And we're actually, uh, next week, we're going to use osmosis and dialysis in a, in a separate experiment. Okay, so we're, we're actually, we're going to do uh, freezing point depression today. And then we're going to do some exercises in um, osmosis and dialysis next week. Okay, so what is osmosis? Osmosis is particular to living systems. Um, and actually, it can be, it can go further abroad. It can be non-living systems too. 
Um, but you to, to describe osmosis, you need a membrane, some kind of membrane between two solutions. So I have solution A on this side and solution B on this side. Okay. Depending on what type of membrane you have. If it's semi-permeable, semi-permeable is particular to um, it's usually restricted, I should say, to allow the passage of water or gas molecules. So water will pass through it uh, either direction. Water is the solvent. Gas will pass through through it fairly easily, but we're not interested in gas right now. Right? If, if, of course, if you're uh, if you're still breathing, <laughs> the ability of gases to pass through semi-permeable membranes is important mm -hmm. because your your blood cells carry oxygen to your cells, and they they're released near the cells, and they pass through the membranes of your cells just like that, no problem. Right, so there's, there's very little restriction for gas molecules. But with a semi-permeable membrane, semi-permeable, we're only gonna allow water to pass through. So if this solution has more water in it, it's gonna go that direction. If it has more water in the solution than this one does, in other words, the solute is less concentrated. You have more water, right? So in biological terms, this one would be, say, hypotonic to this solution. And that means water would move that direction, okay? So if you, if you try to suspend a blood cell in, an, in a hypotonic solution or even distilled water, the water's going to move into the cell. And the cell's going to swell. And um, if the difference in pressure is enough, the cell will rupture. I saw this uh, video. Um, a biology teacher was trying to show his students um, blood cells. So he pricked his finger. He got blood cells on the slide. And it was kind of... Um, it's too concentrated, uh, and you wanted to thin them out. So we put a few drops of distilled water on it, and then put the cover slide on it, and stuck it in the microscope, looked at it, says, there are no cells. They're all gone. You put distilled water on it. The distilled water, in just that amount of time, went into the cells and blew them up. <clears throat> you need to use an isotonic solution, like 0.9% sodium chloride will work. And that way, you won't get any water movement either direction. If uh, this is hypertonic solution, then the water is going to move this direction. Okay? So if this is the cell, water is going to move out of the cell, and it's going to crinolate. It's going to shrivel up and crinkle. You would be able to see the cells then, but they would be well on their way to dying if you put it in a hypertonic solution. Um, and that's the semi-permeable membrane, the way it works. <clears throat> now, suppose we have these two solutions, and instead we have a selectively permeable. Selectively permeable membrane. That allows certain molecules to pass through, not just water, but it allows other molecules to pass through, usually based upon size. So it's a poor size. But they can be engineered, these membranes can be engineered to restrict, uh, keep ions on one side, and let non-ionics through. 
or the other way around, let ionics through and non-ionics stay on the other side. So it's, it's very precise um, engineering problem that's solved with these different types of membranes. We're going to use a, uh, uh, what's this stuff called? Dialysis tubing <clears throat> to do that. So we're going to have uh, a mixture of a couple of things inside the, the tube to put it into still water and then say, okay, is it going to move? Move across the membrane and we have tests that we can run and say, okay, this test says, yep, it's out here. And the other test says, nope, the other one's not there. Or maybe it's the other way around. But the difference between the two, uh, for, from a practical standpoint, is semi-permeable membranes usually uh, only allow water to pass through or gas molecule, whereas selectively permeable are um, can be engineered to allow very small molecules through and restrict the movement of large molecules. That's the kind that we're going to be using next week. Okay, so if you have that membrane there, let's say you have, let's see, if we'll erase those. Let's say you have um, a solution that is very concentrated in this tube and it's dilute for the solute outside. So you have more water outside per unit volume than you do inside. So which way is the water going to move? Into the tube, through the membrane. And this is a semi-permeable membrane. So we're talking about water movement only. So water is going to move in here. And what's it trying to do? Was well, trying to establish equilibrium. It's any type of equilibrium where the rate that water goes in is equal to the rate that water comes out. Right, right now, the water is, is only going in. And as it goes, as it moves through that membrane, it starts to increase the volume in here. So this volume is going to rise up like that. Here. Right? When is it going to stop? It's only going to stop when there's a, a balance of forces. The force that's driving water in is equal to the force driving water out. And you, you tell what that force is based upon the difference in height from here to here. That's osmotic pressure, a measure of osmotic pressure from here to here. If this is very, very, very concentrated, that's going to go way up. If it's only slightly more concentrated, it'll go up just a little bit. And the difference is this would be low osmotic pressure, that would be high osmotic pressure. Okay? Um, and osmotic pressure is usually recorded in atmospheres. And there's a formula that goes with it, in case you're wondering. <clears throat> Okay, um, all right. So the, um, here's your membrane, and these ions can't pass through, but this is the water molecule, and it can go through. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna preferentially go that way, uh, because there's, there are more water molecules on this side impinging on the membrane than there are on the other side. Similar to that uh, discussion of uh, vapor pressure. Uh, and as soon as you get enough water molecules going this way as that way, you're at equilibrium. Um, okay, so that, that's the basic concept behind osmotic pressure. Now, um, we can use the knowledge of this osmotic pressure to run the process backwards. All you have to do is apply artificially a pressure on this concentrated side. And if you increase the pressure enough, water will start moving backwards the other direction. OK? 
Okay, this is called reverse osmosis. If you artificially increase the pressure on the concentrated side, then you can drive water through that membrane into this, and that's how um, we can purify water from seawater. Reverse osmosis. You just drive it through the membranes at high pressure, and it leaves a brine inside the tube, and uh, pure water comes out the other side. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is interesting. <clears throat> see this guy right here? So he's roughly six feet tall. So that's a sequoia. Big, big tree. That'd be 300, 350 feet tall. Well, those trees have a problem. Right? If you pull a vacuum, Say you have a, a container of water and you have a tube in it, this, how high can you make that water go up here if you pull a vacuum? Okay. What's keeping that water up there? Well, if there's no pressure on top because you pulled up all the air out, then there's a force here from the atmosphere that's driving it up, right? That's the force that's being applied. Well, there's a limit. There can only be one atmosphere pressure here or 14.7 pounds per square inch. Right? There's a limit, right? It'll only go so high. And as a practical matter, if you pull a vacuum at sea level, you can only get it to go about 33 feet. That's it. Every scuba diver knows that value. You go down in the water 33 feet, you added another atmosphere on your body. Go down 66 feet, that's two more atmospheres, so a total of three. And so go deeper, deeper, deeper. You can just calculate how much pressure there is on your body. <clears throat> well, if you can pull a vacuum and get the water to go up 33 feet, how do you get it to go 350 feet? Right. Well, um, there was speculation sometime, well, when I was just getting started in sciences. That, well, maybe water evaporates from the leaves at the top of the tree. And as they evaporate, there's surface tension at each one of these um, uh, stomata in the leaf. So the surface tension pulls and it evaporates, pulls, evaporates, pulls. So if you have millions of those stomata up there, maybe there's enough pull, right? Due to an adhesion of water molecules, you can pull the water up. That didn't work. Experiments disproved that. So here's how it really happens. The substances in the tree roots make the sap in the tree roots more concentrated than the water, the groundwater around it. Much, much more concentrated. So that, which way is the water gonna move? It's gonna go into the roots and produce an osmotic pressure once it gets into the xylem. Okay, is that pressure enough to lift water to the top of that tree? Well, it's been measured. That osmotic pressure has been measured at over 20 atmospheres in these big trees. So you got a 20 atmosphere push from the roots, driving that water up because of the difference in osmotic pressure. Okay. So we can calculate, is that enough to reach the, say, 300 foot tall sequoia? Okay. If it's got to go 300 feet, well, that's uh, this many millimeters. First, I convert it to millimeters. And then, um, what kind of pressure is 20 atmospheres in terms of millimeters of water? We know millimeters of mercury, right? 760 is one atmosphere. 
but we want it in terms of water because, um, well, roughly speaking, it's water moving up there. We know it's a solution, but for practical purposes and ease of calculation, we're going to use water. Just pure water will go that high. So if we've got 20 atmospheres pressure, then we can convert that to millimeters of mercury, and then we can use the density uh, difference between water and mercury, which is 13.56 is the density of mercury and the density of water is one. So that's the difference. That's the ratio. And we use that and we find that water will move uh, 10 to the fifth millimeters. Right? If it only has to go 10 to the fourth millimeters or, you know, this is two times 10 to the fifth, this is about one times 10 to the fifth. So yeah, there's enough pressure built up due to osmotic pressure in the roots of that tree to drive the water to the top. And maybe that's why they don't grow any taller than maybe 350 feet. Because once you get to 350, um, these two probably balance. And maybe that's one of the reasons that sequoias don't get any taller than that. Okay, uh, let's see. I just thought that was cool. The problem is finally solved. Now, um, <clears throat> when we start to quantify this osmotic pressure, we need another concept called osmolarity. The uh, osmotic pressure is going to be uh, calculated in terms of molarity right? because temperature has no impact on it whatsoever. That's been proven through experiment. So we can use molarity now, right? Begin. Osmolarity or, or osmol is the same as molarity times this correction factor, this Van Hoff correction factor is what it's called. And it's based upon, uh, primarily based upon, does the molecule, the solute, break apart when it goes into solution? If it breaks apart, say sodium chloride, right? It becomes sodium ions and chloride ions. Right? So for every one of these, you get two of those. So this value would be pretty close to two. That's a correction factor. So osmolarity is the molarity of sodium chloride times two. Um, there are other factors that modify this, so it doesn't have to be a whole number. But for our purposes, we estimate that whole number is based upon the number of ions. Calcium chloride, when it splits apart, makes three ions. So I would be three, or in that neighborhood. The fly in the ointment is that when sodium chloride goes into solution, for instance, it doesn't always stay as sodium ions and chloride ions. Sometimes they get back together, some of them, and make sodium chloride molecule for a short period of time. So, Instead of two, it'd be maybe 1.9. Okay, so three molar sodium chloride would be six osmolar. And there's no symbol for that. Like M for molarity, I don't know. We could make one up, maybe OM or big O. I think Big O is already taken, but not in the scientific sense. Okay. So we talked about hypotonic, hypertonic, isotonic solutions. So we don't need to beat this one anymore. We're just saying that a solution that uh, has a lower osmotic pressure than that within cells is hypotonic. So that just means that water will move into the cell from a hypotonic solution. Whereas a hypertonic water moves the other direction, moves out of the cell. In isotonic solutions, the water doesn't move at all, or very little. Right? So this is an important property to be aware of, correct? 
you inject your patient or if you start an IV in your patient and um, the solution is uh, hypotonic, uh, you'll blow up their cells. If it's hypertonic, you'll crenellate all their cells. But either way is, is not a good ending. So it needs to be isotonic. My wife was recently in the hospital for an operation. She's diabetic. So they couldn't give her certain types of isotonic solution because a lot of them have, um, will affect your blood sugar. So they had to give her just straight 0.9% sodium chloride. And that's okay for a short time because it is isotonic with your cells. The problem is your kidneys don't like it because you're flooding your system with about twice as much sodium as you would normally get in your diet and about 10 times as much chloride as you get in your diet. So you don't want to keep that up for too long as it creates other problems. Okay. Um, so there'll be no movement there. And this is what your blood cells would look like in various situations. Hemolysis would be the result of uh, hypotonic solution, crenelation, or crenation, excuse me. Crenation would be from hypertonic, and this would be isotonic. Ah, okay. So uh, you may, if you know anybody that's an EMT, they may uh, reference uh, D5W. D5W is an isotonic solution, and it just means that it's dextrose, dextrose at 5% mass volume glucose. Okay. So you can give that to a patient if you're trying to replace fluids, uh, unless your patient is diabetic. And if you, if you give that to a diabetic patient, they're going to be in a coma by the time you get to the hospital. So you need to know certain things about your patient. But uh, I did the calculations for this and converted this to osmolality. And it's 0 0.2775 osmol. Uh, 0.9% sodium chloride is not exactly 0.2775. I think it's a little higher than that, but not too much higher. Okay. So, uh, I thought we were going to get the, uh, oh no, left it out, or did, did, I, did I skip it and not see it? Calculation of, of uh, osmotic pressure, because I wanted to fill in the gaps here. Um, osmotic pressure is given the symbol pi, like pi r squared. Osmotic pressure is, um, let's see if I can remember it now, is molarity, okay, uh, is your concentration factor. You have the gas constant and then temperature. So temperature does have an influence on it. But um, if if you know the correction factor, then we would include it here, 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 here the Bantoff correction. Okay. Um, we're not actually gonna be using that one. We might have some problems to work like these in our review document and maybe some of these. I don't, I don't think we have any of these to use. Um, oh, the description I was giving you um, actually, I overestimated 
0.9% uh, sodium chloride is, uh, is not good for your physiology. It overloads your system with sodium by about 10% more than we need and chloride by about 50% more than we need. So it doubles the chloride that you get. It doubles the chloride that you get. Uh, but the sodium, it only increases by about 10%. So sodium is not too bad. And if you want more information, uh, I put the reference here from the NIH. Their reputation has kind of suffered a bit for the last two years with this COVID mess. Probably got a lot of fine people working for them. Just the, the face of the uh, Centers for Disease Control, uh, their administrator and, and Fauci have kind of taken their reputation down several notches because they're both political. Okay. Um, uh, we don't need to spend a lot of time on this one. What's an isotonic solution? where the osmotic pressure is equal on either side of the cell membrane, that's isotonic. Osmolarity of a solution is determined by, multiply the molarity of the solution by the number of particles produced per formula unit. So that's your Van Hoff correction factor. Okay, let's see, we need to do this. How would you prepare 200 milliliters of 0.8 molar sodium hydroxide? Molar mass, 40 grams, solution, water, identify the solute, and solvent. Okay. If you need 200 milliliters of your final volume, and you want the concentration to be 0 0.8 molar, then you know how many moles you're going to need of your solute, M times V. So you have 200 times 0 0.8 would give you the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. And then you convert moles to mass using your conversion factor. So if you have the number of moles, then you multiply, well, you do it like this. Moles would be on the bottom, grams on the top, so we'd have 40 here. 40 times that, and that would give you mass. Okay, so the answer is, oops. Oh. I never know when I'm going to animate these things. Here we go. 0 0.16 moles sodium hydroxide, and then convert that to grams, 6.4 grams of sodium hydroxide. We'll give you that concentration. Okay. Uh, how about this one? If you add 2.6 grams of sodium chloride with this molar mass to 300 milliliters of water, what's the molar molarity, uh, percent mass volume, and molar osmolarity? So it can calculate it three different ways. Oops. I didn't animate this one. Okay. So... Um, I would do molarity, and then sodium chloride would have a factor of two multiplied by it to give you osmolarity. And then mass per unit volume is 2.6 grams of sodium chloride. And you have to assume that the... Uh, Introduction of sodium chloride is not going to change the volume of the solution. You just have to assume that. Um, so you would divide it by uh, mass per volume percent. So we'd say 2.6 divided by 300 milliliters. So it'd be grams per milliliter. You've already, and you have to multiply it by 100. Right? So 0.15, 2.6 divided by 3. Let's see. Is that right? 
2.6 grams per milliliter volume. Grams per milliliter. Mass percent times 100. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, I think that's it. Yep.